or functions of the government. However, the way most governments make rules has not successfully kept up with the state and the speed of technology development, nor with the rising complexities of people's need. More often than not, the policymaking process is linear and siloed, and this creates issues and problems, especially during implementation. These issues are also not very easy to fix. In addition, legislation, regulation, and policies are complex and interconnected. Changing one can have unintended consequences on others. Rules are time consuming to draft. They are hard to model, and sometimes they are difficult to understand for the public. Consistent implementation of rules remains one of the biggest challenges, and it impacts the trust of the public. Admittedly, the current system does not have the agility needed for fast and effective implementation of digital services that can meet the needs of our people. And I think the current pandemic has highlighted some of the problems I mentioned. Rules as Code is the approach to create and publish legislation, regulation, and policies as human and machine readable. It is an emerging concept in the public sector innovation. Countries like France and New Zealand are among the early adapters of this approach. Now, a fair question to ask and something that might be already on your mind is, what's the difference between coded rules, which already exist, in fact, we are using it, and the rules as code? Here's a diagram to show the difference, and we are going to start on the left side with the coded rules approach. Suppose we have two applications that need to use the exact same policy. Application one can be a chatbot, application two can be a web-based form. Both applications need the same policy, and they need the policy in machine-readable language in order to function. If we take the coded rules approach, each application needs to interpret and implement the rules in their code independent of the other. This means doing the same process two times. In addition to duplicating time and human efforts, it is very much possible that each application ends up with a unique interpretation and therefore a unique implementation of the exact same policy. So there will be inconsistencies. Now for a moment, imagine that we have 10 or 100 applications that are created for this exact same policy. And then you can understand the scale of resource in terms of human and time and the scale of inconsistent consistencies that is created under this approach. And this is our current situation. In this approach, policy people often work independent of those who create the application and those who end up using the application for public administration of policies. If we look on the right hand side, under the rules as code, we take the rules and encode them with the help of policy experts. In this, as, in this approach, policy analysts and application developers work closely together to ensure that the policy intent is accurately captured and translated into machine readable language. We place these rules into a rules engine, which can be shared among many applications. In this approach, we need to do the process once. Obviously, it's very important that we do a fantastic job of doing this so emphasis on co-creating the policy. A rules as code engine allows for consistency of implementation, faster development, and it saves times and effort. Now, looking back at our problem space, rules as code can help us with digital service agility on a few fronts. By serving as a single authoritative interpretation of what the rules mean, we can speed up digital service delivery. Rules as code can make the job of policymaker and legislative drafters easier as well. Certain mistakes that might be hard to see in a human language, such as English and French, become much more obvious when we try to encode them into the rule. 
Writing an inhuman and machine readable language encourages policy people to be more precise about what they are saying. In addition, machine executable legislation can be tested. In essence, the legislation can be debugged as it is being written, minimizing the loopholes down the road. With tools such as Policy Difference Engine, which Regan will showcase in the next few minutes, we can run simulations as laws are updated to see the real world consequence on population before we commit to policy change. This makes modeling an easier and a more informed process. Last but definitely not least, Rules as Code uses technology to enable collaboration in creating regulation, legislation, and policy and this makes for a more holistic and inclusive approach to policy design and delivery. I'm going to pass it on to Regan to take us to the second part of our presentation. All right, thanks, uh, Dana. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, we, oops, there we go. Um, okay, so we did a, a three week collaborative sprint. So I'm going to show uh, what we made from that sprint, and then I'm going to talk about the process a little bit. So uh, we created a rules engine. So to create a rules engine, first thing you need is a rule. Uh, now the term rule is fairly flexible, but here it could mean something like policy, regulation, um, or legislation, essentially some written government document that answers some precise questions. Um, and the rules engine is going to encode that rule very precisely. So um, nothing more, nothing less, has to be very precise. Um, you want it to basically be a coded version of that document. Um, it should also be very transparent or open source so that everybody can see how it works. This helps to build trust. Uh, it should be reusable. So as Dana was saying, it can be used by multiple applications. You're only doing that work once. Um, and be, yeah, just many different systems can use it, whether it be like user facing chatbots, web applications, mobile apps, et cetera. Um, and it should also be testable. You should be able to come up with some, some scenarios um, and your expected output, and you should be able to run those tests on your system. So we'll look at an actual example of the rules that we encoded and applied. Uh, so this is the motor vehicle operators hours of work regulations um, that phrase is a bit of a mouthful, but uh, these regulations are very specific in what they address. Uh, it's only about three pages, um, but it primarily addresses overtime hours for motor vehicle operators. So the Canada Labour Code, which is a very important piece of legislation, specifies that workers in general are entitled to overtime after eight hours of work a day or 40 hours a week. This regulation overrides these amounts specifically for motor vehicle operators. So for example, if you're a motor vehicle operator that operates mainly within a city, you're called a city motor vehicle operator, um, you're entitled to overtime after nine hours instead of eight. Um, if you're a highway motor vehicle operator, you actually don't have a limit for daily overtime. You have a weekly limit, but not a daily. Um, there are various reasons for this. Um, I'm not really able to do those reasons proper justice, but um, a lot of the motivation there is that uh, reduces the number of days that they are away from their family, um, et cetera. So th things like that. Um, but the idea is that this regulation, it sets new thresholds for motor vehicle operators. Um, and these thresholds, they depend uh, very much on the classification of motor vehicle operator. So whether you're a highway operator, city operator, bus operator, or warehouse worker for a company that operates um, motor vehicles. Um, and so the final um, wrench here is that a, an operator can actually work um, under these different classifications during a single work shift. So if you travel a certain distance away from your home terminal, um, you're considered highway. But then if you move within that radius, um, then you're considered city. And if you operate a bus, you're considered bus. Um, if you operate a bus on the highway, then um, I think, I, yeah, I can't remember that one actually. Um, but so, so you could potentially work at different classifications during a single shift. So these mixed schedules make it very difficult um, to calculate the amount of overtime that a motor vehicle operator would be entitled to. So um, the regulations are fairly small. Um, they're very precise and they're, they're quite number heavy. They, they contain calculations and decision making. Um, so this means it's a very good candidate for a rules as code engine. Um, and just to give like a quick taste of these regulations, um, 
here is some legalese language. Th these, are, this is a taste of the actual regulations themselves. Um, and you can see it gets ab absurdly confusing very, very quick. Uh, so, where during any period of two or more weeks in which an employee is employed, he works in any week and not less than two of the following classes of employment. So, so like already that's one sentence and it's already a huge mouthful. Um, and uh, so this is this speaks to why it's very important to get these policy experts in the room to help help wade through this uh, this legalese here, right? Um, okay, so this slide here, this shows, uh, for example, some of the questions that are answered by these regulations. So as a motor vehicle operator, given this complex schedule, um, how many hours of overtime am I entitled to? Or it can answer a question like, what classification of motor vehicle operator do I fall under? So you give it some information and it gives you an answer back. So this is the idea of this, this question answering machine that, that aims to capture precisely the questions um, addressed by the uh, regulations. So we can start to brainstorm of some types of user facing applications that might use this engine. So typically the, the rules as code engine isn't used directly by users. It may be like getting technical, it may be a software package, it may be an API, et cetera, that is used by other user facing applications, such as a chatbot, um, a mobile app um, that wants to know like what type of motor vehicle operator am I? It could be used by an HR or accounting application by, by a company. Um, there could be, we could build research tools around it. It could be um, service tools for service agents um, on the phone with, with people who want to know these, these uh, questions as well. Um, so that's just a, a big sample of, of different types of applications that could be used. Um, and as Dana was saying, without rules as code, without the rules as code approach, the developers of each of these applications are going to need to interpret and implement uh, the rules themselves. So they need to get through all of that legalese, interpret all the different ambiguities, get the requirements from policy experts, and go through that that entire process to find out exactly what the regulations are saying. Um, Policy experts, difficult to get a hold of, not because they don't want to, just because it's a big, big system. Um, and we don't want to have to repeat that process over and over. So we make the system once, we make it open uh, so that it can be tested and changed, um, and those changes can be verified, and then anyone can use it. So in our case, we, we expose the rules as an API. Uh, so now we're going to look at an example of one, of one such application that is built on top of a rules as code engine. Um, this is the policy difference engine. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's do this. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this is a policy difference engine for this uh, regulation. So the idea of a policy difference engine um, is to measure the impact of potential changes to a rule. Uh, there's a lot of possible changes that we could make to the rules. We could we could change the classification criteria for motor city or for city operators, highway operators, etc. We could add new classifications. We could change some of those thresholds, um, or maybe we get rid of the regulation altogether and see see how it affects the overtime calculations. So so it's a big space, um, and for our prototype, we wanted to narrow it down a bit. So we're asking the following question: What is the impact? on overtime of changing the various threshold values in the overtime calculation that is specified in those regulations. Um, so for example, suppose we change the threshold for a city motor vehicle operator from nine hours to eight hours. Um, how is that going to affect the schedules on the whole, like in the aggregate? Um, how much overtime the whole, like across the industry, how much do people gain um, or lose? Uh, how will it affect certain demographic groups of drivers, et cetera? There, there's a lot of factors when considering the impact. And uh, this attempts to address some of them, um, not all of them, because there's a lot, but it's uh, starting to build a model. Okay, so let's have a look here. Uh, at the top, we have a, uh, a schedule. So you can enter in um, the hours that you work each day as these different categories. So CMVO is city motor vehicle, HMVO is highway motor vehicle, and then there's other. So that's if you're working in a warehouse or, or even as like a bus operator. So I'm just gonna enter some, some values in here. Um, you can also specify that summer holidays, uh, if you want as well, let's say, or let's call this a holiday because the holiday is going to affect the overtime hours as well. Um, okay, so let's make that their schedule. Okay, so then um, down below here, uh, we have the simulation cases. So this is where we have the option of proposing changes to the regulation. So here we can change the various thresholds and values that are used in the overtime calculation and see what happens. So we'll do a few changes. Let's, as we said, let's change this um, nine to eight. 
let's change this uh, 45 to 40. This is changing it to be in line with the Canada Labor Code. So maybe that's a proposed change someone wants to try. And we'll make uh, another change there just, just to see what happens. OK, so when I run this, when I click run here, um, there's quite a bit that's going to happen under the hood. So first of all, it's going to take this schedule that I input and it's going to run it um, against these existing regulations using the, that rules engine. Uh, so the result of that is going to be a number of hours of overtime. Uh, then it's going to do the same thing with this second set. It's gonna take that schedule, use the rules engine with this set of rules, and it's gonna get a different value for the overtime. Uh, so then we're gonna see the difference between the, these two sets of rules. So let's run it and see what we get. Okay, so in this case, um, under the existing regulations, they are entitled, this schedule is entitled to two hours of overtime. Under that change, so with, with these parameters, they would be entitled to seven hours. So, so it's a different of five hours. And, and that's just with this one schedule. So I could modify the schedule and, and or modify some of the parameters here down at the bottom as part of the rule and, and see what happens. So, so this is an example of how a change could affect one schedule. Um, this is a prototype tool for policy researchers. So a potential next step would be to gather like thousands of real schedules, uh, cycle all of them through this proposed change using the rules engine and see how it affects these schedules in the aggregate. So you could see how many hours are gained or lost on average. You could break it down by different demographics to see if any groups are like disproportionately affected, et cetera. So, so that has been proposed uh, for, for some future work. Uh, so, so that's a, just a quick, demo of a, of a application that is built on top of a rules as code engine. Um, so now what I want to do is uh, I want to go to the next slide and there we go. And I want to talk a bit more about the process that we took for developing the system. So we embarked on this three week collaborative sprint that was organized by the CSPS, so the, the Canada School of Public Service. Uh, they brought together all of these different organizations, community of federal regulators, ESDC, Code for Canada, Department of Justice, um, to collaborate on building this definitive source of coded rules uh, for this particular regulation. Um, for that process, we, we built on a lot of, uh, or we, we built on some existing processes that were used as part of a previous rules as code sprint. Um, and then we added some of our own uh, new ideas as well. Um, and what we found very early was that there was a big knowledge gap. Uh, so certain tech terminology could be um, misinterpreted or people can just be unfamiliar with some of the terminology, which can make people uncomfortable. Um, with the whole process. So we wanted to smooth out that knowledge gap and uh, we created a, a custom presentation uh, that brought all of the policy people and the non-technical people up to speed on certain relevant technical concepts, such as um, like a broad overview of security, uh, application lifecycle development, web APIs, source control, like what is GitHub? Um, what does it mean to have your code stored in GitHub or having your code deployed to the cloud, et cetera. So, so we did a broad overview just to get them comfortable with some of the terminology that was being used and to establish a, a common language that we could, uh, we could speak to with them because we were collaborating for three weeks. Uh, some other processes uh, that were part of this sprint, uh, concept modeling. This is where we, we go through the regulations. We create high level relationships uh, between like the nouns and the verbs. Uh, so we, we create the concept of overtime. We say, what is overtime specifically? We talk about the, the city operator, the highway operator. What do those mean? What are the definitions? Um, decision trees. This is the process of creating flow charts that show step-by-step step how calculations are done and how decisions are made. So if one of the questions is you wanna know what is your classification? So you ask a series of questions that leads you down this flow chart uh, to get you the answer. Uh, we did a, these example walkthroughs where we created these sample scenarios um, that we would walk through step by step. So we would apply those flow charts to these examples with the policy experts, of course, and uh, we would like try try to find identify any sort of ambiguities and come to the come to the actual calculation of the overtime result. Um, we did this black hat session. We tried to find, we all took on these different personas like a crime boss or um, the CEO of a big tech company who, who might want to profit off of this. Um, we took on these personas and we tried to find ways to break these regulations and take advantage of it. Um, and then of course, we, we wrote the actual code itself. Uh, we wrote a lot of tests for that code. And then we 
we would iterative, iteratively get feedback from the policy experts. So, so it was somewhat of an agile approach where we would be coding, we would present our code and get feedback from it, then go back to coding. It was, it was a very short term, like it was only three weeks, but, but we did kind of do that, uh, that agile approach where we get constant feedback and, and iterate on the product. Um, so the results for this rules as code sprint, we coded the rules, um, those regulations in an API. We built that policy difference engine, PDE. We built that web application on top of the rules as code engine to simulate different schedules. Uh, we reached a greater understanding, uh, shared understanding of policy making. So, so the technology side got a very good understanding of the policy making process and the policy people got a, a deeper understanding of the technology involved. Um, we identified some ambiguities within the regulations. So as we went through them, uh, some of the policy experts had these moments where they realized sub subjecting the, the, the regulation to this technical lens, getting down right into the details where we need to code it, highlights some of these ambiguities where, where they weren't sure really like what, what the actual like definition of the regulation was. Uh, so there were some ambiguities uh, and we brought those to light. And then we also built wireframes um, and suggestions for future work on this. Um, so, uh, that's the demo and uh, just a bit about the process as well. So, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Sidra to talk a little bit more about what, what we're doing. Thank you so much, Regan. Um, can folks see my screen? Yep, all good. Okay, awesome. So, uh, I mean, uh, after learning about all of that, we've got all of the rules. Now what? Why is it important? Why does it matter? What are the implications? So here is where the policy difference engine comes in. So we as a team have been assigned to the maternity rules that exist within the EI Act. And EI legislation is incredibly complex. It's actually one of the fifth most complicated laws, apparently, that around social security in the world. Um, but maternity and parental benefits are an integral part of the Canadian employment support system. So they, they are, it is a pretty solid candidate for us to look at. Um, by building a policy difference engine on top of a rules engine, we might be able to, like Regan mentioned, start aggregating and tabulating just like a better, more meaningful understanding of the potential impact of a possible policy change. This hinges on tracking down real data so we can recreate these simulations with some level of confidence. And it also means finding policy experts in the area of EI maternity benefits to help us better interpret these oft complex written rules. Ultimately, we want to build a flexible rules engine that um, can be adapted for any policy, really, but everyone's got to start somewhere, and here's where we started. So a unique problem within a lot of IT projects within government is often that things like privacy, bureaucracy, unsurprisingly, and operational limitations can preclude us sometimes from having direct access to our potential users. So this doesn't mean that we can't do the thing. This means that we use hypothesis generating techniques that we borrow from social sciences, um, using four uh, research design tools. Uh, we won't go too much into detail, but I just want folks to be able to understand that connection between user-centered design and what we're working on. So the tools we used were proto-personas, hypothesis testing, best practices, and domain research. I'll touch on each of these a little bit. So proto-personas are awesome when you don't have actual people to talk to who are your stakeholders. They give your organization a starting point from which to begin evaluating your products and create some early design hypotheses. Um, it's basically like an existing target that you can work towards, and it can be pretty useful technique as long as your product is in the ideation stage and it's agile by design to account for the evolving user needs and to account for the fact that these personas are going to change as you do more information gathering. The second point was really understanding how policy is made across government. Policy making is incredibly complex, and this is where our stakeholder interviews came in. We covered a lot of ground from academic policy analysis to think tanks, from economic consultants to internal policy units, and our friends at StatsCan, all across operations, um, economists, sociodemographic statistics. There's a whole bunch, a, a lot of things to consider, which is why this process is quite complex. But it, it, it warrants that level of interdisciplinariness. Uh, because what we're essentially uh, settling on is an interdisciplinary approach to policy analysis itself to ensure that what we create isn't just useful, but it's also usable and it's appropriate for the breadth of impact it can have. The questions we'd ask cover not just the measurable quantifiers of policy design, like what will be the impact of this policy on income tax returns, which is kind of the way a lot of things are done now, 
It would also include deeper questions around inequity and impact. Like what is the lived experience of a person currently waiting on the phone for four hours to get some answers about maternity benefits, things like that, right? And ultimately the goal is to really be able to identify the structural changes that will reduce inequity or disparity in specific communities that have inequitable access to these things. Um, there's a lot of significant implications to the simplest of policy changes. Like Regan just demoed what changing one number can do. And when we don't have a holistic sense of these impacts, we can struggle with the lack of common understanding, particularly amongst folks who rely on social income supports like EI or maternity benefits. Um, so here's just some examples that are in moderate current news right now that have to do with the fact that people's labor profiles are changing, that um, if people apply for a specific type of maternity benefit, as per the legislation right now, they can't actually change once they've been paid out. So if they make a mistake, it gets quite messy. Um, which brings us to basically where we started. So on top of that rules engine that we can talk about, we started with these basic balsamic wireframes, just with our vision around what we could potentially do. We then continued to build a, a viable prototype that we're able to click through and create simulation cases. And then with that, we can uh, basically get results that are aggregated by potentially the socio-demographics we have access to. And we're in a really exciting exercise right now trying to get this information. And these tables alone would provide value to analysts if doing predictive analysis, but in the future, here's where we could go. We could have these beautiful, meaningful and carefully constructed data visualizations that wouldn't necessarily point out the inequities, but they would validate some of our concerns um, and they would allow um, lay folks to just be able to better understand the potential implications of a simple policy change. So it's, it's a lot of really exciting stuff, but it's also like very overwhelming, right? So ultimately, the future state of rules as code that we imagine is a future where we can predict the potential impacts of a possible policy change, where we can sustain policy agility, which is all about responding to changing needs and evolving as a government, which is uh, including driving evidence-based decision-making and governance, increasing transparency and accountability, and ultimately to better serve folks who fall through the cracks. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, we'd love for you to stay connected if you're interested in our work. You can check out the work that we're doing at teambabel.ca. And yeah, thank you. So please, I'm excited to see your questions. I see we have quite a few here. Um, yeah, I'm going to hand it back to Dena.